more susceptible to the influences of the media. Teenage savages go wild in a juvenile jungle of lust and lawlessness. A blood tide of filth threatening to pervert an entire generation of our American children. I'm Dr. Ben Litherland. And I'm Dr. Richard McCulloch. We research media audiences. And this is Ill Effects, the good podcast about bad media influences. Today's episode, we are going to be talking about uh, Barbie and body image. Um, first things first, how many Oppenheimer gags are we going to be doing today? <laughs> I hadn't even planned for this. Damn, I've missed, I've missed, I've missed a really op- obvious opportunity. Uh, we're, allowed, we're allowed one An each. An obvious opportunity. Oh, no, sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll do better than that. I promise I'll get better. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> okay, so the context for today's episode is a long-standing and long-running debate and discussion about... Um, Barbie's influence, uh, particularly on young girls, particularly when it comes to uh, something called negative body image. Um, So the accusation goes something like, so I've got a quote um, from a Daily Mail article in October 1990, and the title of the article is called The Anorexics Age 8. Um, And the quote goes, increasing numbers of pre-teenage children are receiving hospital treatment for eating disorders as they attempt to emulate role models like Madonna, the Princess of Wales, and fashion doll Barbie. Hmm. It's the most 1990 Daily Mail (laughs) set of interests (laughs) you could have. What are your initial thoughts, feelings, and comments about this statement? I mean, I'm. I, I guess my initial question actually is is about is not so much specifically about the quote, but I'm wondering a bit of a chicken and egg sort of situation. Like, do these concerns over anorexia predate concerns about Barbie, or vice versa? It's a very interesting question, Rich. Hopefully. One of the things that we can do is start to explore this relationship. And um, I suppose the anxiety about body image is something that we're going to return to, um, because in many ways, that is as much a modern idea as the concept of Barbie. And the linkage of the two is something that we can uh, interrogate and explore as we go on. Mm. So the question that we are attempting to answer today, um, does Barbie give you eating disorders? Mm. What's the answer, Ben? Let's find out. (laughs) So let's start with a short history of the Barbie doll. Uh, Barbie earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in chemistry from Harvard University in 1920. Fucking hell. Is this this the podcast I've agreed to to do Uh, with you? We're only on episode two. I, it's so it's such a lame joke. I was like, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm just going to be bold and I'm just going to get it done. That's an Oppenheimer joke if you've been uh, Oppenheimer got in that degree in chemistry. From Harvard University. Okay, that's the last one. I promise I'm not doing any more. You can do as many as you want, but that's that's my one. No more um, H-bombs done. dropped in this episode, please. <laughs> Excellent. Mm. Good. That quirk of uh, promotional popular culture history to one side. Uh, so, the actual history of Barbie. Um... There's quite an intense official Mattel history of Barbie. Um, talk me through, like, what what is your impression of the early history of Barbie? I, I don't honestly don't have much to go on. I'm really excited to learn about it. And I, I know you've you've sort of teased me by saying you've got some really quite uh, juicy bits of uh, research and dodgy methods, which I'm really excited about learning. Uh, but in terms of the history of the toys, um, it's not been a part of my life. I didn't play with Barbies as a child. But actually, my strongest memory is not of Barbie, is with Cindy, which is the as far as I'm aware, like the, the cheap British version yeah. uh, of Barbie, yeah. um, which was quite popular among a lot of um, children when I was growing up. And my main memory of it is seeing a girl holding a Cindy doll when I was around my mate's house. This was his younger sister, who's about two at the time, who then um, whacked me over the head with a cricket bat. <laughs> so if dolls, fashion dolls drove 
her to, to that terrible behaviour? I don't know. That's a that's a but separate question for a different episode. Maybe a later episode on that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, honestly, I'm, I'm very happy for you to tell me all about what you found out. There's a really sanitised official Mattel version of the history that goes something like Ruth Handler had a young daughter. Uh, Ruth Handler was watching her young daughter play with the only toys on the market at the time for young girls, which was dollies, so like babies. So you could, um, you know, pretend that you were going to be a mother and these other things. Uh, And she thought there was a gap in the market for a fashion doll that gave you access and entry into other forms of play that young girls um, would appreciate. And there's some stuff about... um, getting the inspiration for the Barbie doll from a uh, German sex doll or kind of parody sex doll called uh, a build. I'm I'm sorry, what? Uh, Yeah, (laughs) no, a a, a joke present that you give to give to men on their stag do's. Like it's a Uh, a like a blow up doll sort of thing. No, like an actual figurine, uh, an actual figurine. Um, So there's a in the less official Mattel history, the the first Barbie and the first uh, it's called a build the lily uh, looks quite similar. Um, she obviously took inspiration, so she buys the doll, takes it back, right, and repurposes it and refashions yeah. it, and asks you know people to kind of remake a version. But there are quite distinct similarities, um, and that's it. So broadly, the doll is launched in uh, 1959, um, and I've got a clip actually of you. Um, have a quick look at the first ever television advertisement um, that accompanied the launch of the Barbie doll. Um, if we give a quick watch of that, I think it gives you a, a nice snapshot and flavour of, of what Barbie was trying to do. What year is this? This is 59. Barbie, you're beautiful. You make me feel My Barbie doll is really Barbie's small and so petite, her clothes and figure look so neat. Her dancing outfit rings the bell, at parties she will cast a spell. Purses, hats and gloves galore, and all the gadgets gals adore. Barbie dressed for swim and fun is only $3. Her lovely fashions range from $1 to $5. Look for Barbie wherever dolls are sold. Someday I'm gonna be exactly like you. Till then I know just what I'll do Barbie, beautiful Barbie I'll make believe that I am you You can tell it's Mattel, it's swell (laughs) That's that's such a shit tagline (laughs) Oh God, that's that's like, you know, in the boardroom They're like, oh, can we come up with something Something like, you can tell it's Mattel and it's swell, but but not that because that's awful. But you know, come up with what you can, and they're like, let's just go with that. And then they're in the pub by three p.m. Exactly. If, if I've watched Mad Men. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. We're, we're all commercials that long back in 1959. I think that, they were actually. I've, really used, long. I've used older commercials in my teaching before, right. and I'm always like, oh, this this television spot is like 45 to 60 seconds, yeah. as opposed to the sort of 15 or 30 that we used to. Any longer, and it becomes infomercial territory. Yeah, no, it's it's the pace of media has um, sped up mm. o- over the years. Um, I've also got another quote that I think just kind of picks up on some of these other bits that were in the advert. So this is um, from the print, but I, I just want to read it because I think it, it, it is quite interesting for something we're going to look at a little bit later. Um, so the quote goes an exciting all new kind of doll she's shapely and grown up with fashion apparel authentic in every detail this is Barbie so curvy flesh toned and lifelike she almost breathes and stands alone girls of all ages will thrill to the fascination of her miniature wardrobe of fine fabric fashions tiny zippers that really zip coats with luxurious carefully tailored linings jeweled earrings necklaces and colour coordinated sunglasses what are your initial responses to the type of promotional materials that were being produced about Barbie? Well, I mean, you asked me before what my frame of reference was for Barbie. I have seen the the recent film, okay, the Greta Gerwig film, um, and I did recognise some of the outfits, the swim, the black and white swimsuit, yeah, um, from the commercial. There, I, I recognise that from the film, and the wedding dress I think was in it as well. Um, yeah, it's some of the language is a bit. I don't know if it's weird or if it's just like, you know, times have changed. Um, But certainly terms like shapely and curvy are not in keeping with how we would use those terms today. Yes. I would say. Um, 
flesh toned is a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> just because it makes me think, what color were they before? Like, what color were dolls before Barbie? I don't know. Um, so yeah, and also from watching the commercial, um, I don't remember. Did Barbie always have a trapezium shaped head? Is that always a thing? Yeah, I yeah, guess so. Right. Yeah. It's, it's news to me. No, but. within within Barbie subcultures, because of the course there's Barbie subcultures. So like yeah. the, the pre Barbie, so like her eyes, yeah, like her eyes are down and yeah. then they like turned up. That's right. quite a big moment in Barbie history. Um right. in part because that uh, according to some critics or you know, Barbie fans in particular, that reflects like a changing attitude. Uh, to gender, mm-hmm. um, it's quite an important moment. Like she's looking at you and not looking down. She's not looking coy, um, and it's something that we're going to explore a lot. I think you picked up on the main things that I wanted to pick up there. Um, that from the off, there's been a quite big interest in Barbie's body, um, mm. or it's been promoted. You know, Barbie's body has been quite central to narratives of Barbie um, from the get go. Perhaps not in ways that we would understand mm. that as now like like you the like calling barbie kind of um shapely and grown up um is perhaps not something that necessarily modern critics would associate with barbie yeah and interesting that that mattel are putting that language it's not like yes. it's not like these concerns are coming from outside and people going oh what's what's up with her weird body with yes. her shapely figure or whatever yeah it's, yeah it's mattel giving us that language yes and that's something to hold on to i think in in bits of the conversation that we're going to have in a in a second is um mattel have always got this slightly ambivalent relationship to where they're positioning Barbie in relationship to the broader social changes that are taking place. So Barbie's launched in 59, right into like the early stages of post-war mm. um, feminism. Um, and that relationship is going to um, both productively and unproductively shape how Barbie is received, shape the sorts of things that Mattel is willing to do. Um, one thing that I don't want us to do is to be like, Mattel is a feminist brand, or like Barbie is a feminist brand. Um, but I also don't think it's necessarily anti-feminist. I think yeah. it has this really kind of complicated, um, longer history with mm. feminism. So at points in its promotion, it's leaning in without fully embracing the term. Yeah. At other points, it's reactive to and trying to distance itself um, from um, the F word. But the F word is going to interact with Barbie in kind of increasingly interesting ways um, as we continue through this episode. Um, So uh, I read um, as part of the research for this, there's a couple of historians called um, Pearson and Mullins um, that wrote a kind of promotional history of Barbie. So like a brand history of Barbie looking Ah. at the promotional materials. um, And they kind of cluster, so this was written in the 90s when kind of Barbie, the Barbie panic or the Barbie anxiety is possibly at at its peak and and they're trying to kind of reimagine or kind of locate Barbie in the promotional materials as opposed to as a kind of figure that exists outside of that. They talk about like four eras. So the uh, Barbie did not do rough housework from 59 to 63, which I think is quite interesting. Hmm. Um, One of the things that Barbie is, is like a fashion brand. She's not domesticated. She's glamorous. She's these other things. And there is a return in 63 to the domestic ideal, which lasts um, mostly for the rest of the um, 60s. Um, There's a disappearance of domesticity um, from 68. So kind of um, some of the slightly more like famous, like Barbie goes to work Mm. type um, dolls are launched then. Um, interestingly, I thought as a response to like Reaganism, uh, Mattel are kind of publicly criticised a little bit from the conservative right for this, you know, second wave feminism. Um, and Mattel responds, as most brands do, they sort of pull back. They, they don't like the drama um, of it all. So there's a, a return to like second shift Barbie. She, she, she goes back into the house. Mm. Um, as with any of like a, a text as rich as Barbie and as long as Barbie and has as long a history as Barbie, there are contradictions already. There's a messiness to um, the meanings that people can attach to Barbie. And I I think that's something that we're going to return to um, as we continue through the episode. Um, I think the 60s and 70s is a real interesting moment where Barbie sits as a um, lightning rod for controversies, both from the American conservative right and also 
I'm saying the left, but certainly feminist campaigners. And Barbie becomes a bit of a kind of image that you can use, in part because she's so successful by this point. Like she's she's super successful, um, really does kind of. Uh, captures the market like almost instantly and immediately, and there's there's bits of data that we'll look at in terms of like how many girls play with Barbies, mm. um, possibly a little bit later. Um, so examples of this: um, a young girl at the women's strike for equality uh, in 1972, and um, quite famously holds up a sign saying, "I'm not a Barbie doll." Um, there was pickets at a wholesale toy, wholesale toy fair, um, similar similarish time. Um, to protest the making of what they said were sexist and militarist toys. So, you know, Barbie, G.I. Joe. Yeah. Um, they, they distributed leaflets that said the fashion dolls such as Barbie, Dawn and Chrissy perpetuated sexual stereotypes by encouraging little girls to see themselves solely as mannequins, sex objects or housekeepers. That's a really good quote. Uh, what What do they mean by encouraging them to see themselves? Why would... Encouraging them to see themselves is interesting language there. Like, why why would you assume that that's what the girls are doing with these dolls? Is that is that something that was had any foundation to it? Was there, I don't even mean research necessarily, but is that like the way that girls talked about these dolls? Were they using them as reflections of themselves like when they played with them? Is that... So I don't think that type of research exists. I don't think it's based on research. I think no. it's... I think part of what is happening is that the height of second wave feminism, um, women are looking for cultural objects that, you know, reflect the criticisms that they want to make of of, of wider culture. Um, as I think we're going to talk about, like, children are always easy accessories when you're trying to make a broader point about... Yes. Um, a fair criticism of, you know, the, the, the types of limiting, um, you know... Um, limiting roles that were for women, you know, if you think back to the kind of classic second wave feminism critiques of like housewives, um, sex objects, like that, that's that's in the water and yeah. not unfairly so. Um, and I think Barbie becomes as much a figure, um, an iconic figure. She's already a figure at this point. Um, she becomes a figure in which to possibly project some of those criticisms. Mm. Um, it does a decent job, I suppose. Of the, so this is picked up in the uh, New York Times. Um, so the, the the criticisms, particularly at the toy fair, um, there's kind of a group of women with kind of signs and they're picketing it, and that yeah. does does get attention. So I, I think it's an interesting thing, both for yeah, I, I agree. I, I'm I'm not sure influence would be possibly the question that we're looking at. Um, but it is something that people always return to, this kind of question of influence, I think. I, I guess it, it comes back to the question I asked before about the anorexia quote that you opened with. Is Were people already having these discussions about about other toys or dolls or aspects of young girls' lives in terms of, in terms of self-image and how they see themselves as women to be and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so I think the, the the toy point is really interesting because I think the wider discussion is happening around toys in the 1970s. What I find interesting about this specific quote, um, to see themselves solely as mannequins, sex objects or housekeepers, is the criticism of body image isn't there at that point. Mm. So they're making a broader yes. claim about influence, but what isn't there is... Actually, something that I take for granted now is that body will uh, that Barbie will give young girls an unrealistic sense of her own body, and yeah. that that is bad because of you know whatever whatever the reasons that that is bad for. So I think there's a really interesting shift from '72 when feminists are criticizing Barbie for pro uh, promoting particular types of roles, social roles, and 1990 when Barbie is being criticized for producing particular types of eating disorders but this focus on or the ambivalent relationship to feminism and gender um is the context really for a, another debate that i want to get into this question of eating disorders mm. um, and the way that barbie shifts in the types of criticisms that she is garnering um is something that i'm really really interested in and i'm really fascinated by um, so again, just to give you a little bit of the context for this. Um, so did you see in 2016 that Mattel launched um, the first ever Curvy Barbie? No. No. 
So this got huge amounts of press um, at the time. Um, obviously, not huge enough for me. Not in so. places where you were reading <laughs> the press, but it was it was front page news rich. News rich. Uh, so like Time magazine did a cover story on it. Um, there's a really interesting documentary called Tiny Shoulders Rethinking Barbie, um, which I watched in preparation for this, um, which is at Mattel in the lead up to this transition. Um, and oh, my God, like I've never wanted to work in a toy company, any, but like the levels of stress that these people are causing themselves, um, both for like imagining what people are going to say and like all of the drama it creates for basically creating a Barbie that is a right. size like 12 or something like it's in terms of the PR kind of people you think oh like, mate like, like honestly there's, there's whole rooms of them so they war game that they, launch so they, they, they do an imagined war game launch where all of the company sit in a room um, two weeks before they do the actual launch um, they wrote like angry upset tweets they, they created them, and then we're like, how are you going to respond to this? You're like, this this guy online is calling you a fucking knobhead. That's not, not like the direct quote. Like, but like, you're a fucking knobhead. Like, fat Barbie, you're encouraging uh, obesity or whatever. And they're like, oh, this is really upsetting. It's like, it's your fucking <laughs> tweets. What are you on about? Is it, hang on. Is this... I, I don't work in PR. I never have. <laughs> is this standard practice? I assume, Let's make up all sorts of horrible shit that people might say about us. I assume so. And then feel bad about it. I, I imagine. And have a breakdown. Yeah. And I, 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 I don't know. I don't know if that's general practice, but this is something that they, I mean, I assume so. But they were so, this is, I suppose it's interesting, not necessarily for that that's what they've done, but that that's how invested they were in like, this is how much of a big deal this is. Right. They spend, yeah, yeah. yeah hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars on practicing what the response was going to be and the response was broadly positive um and i think how do we get to this moment when mattel feels um pressured enough almost to be like well we've got to we've got to respond to this we've got to do something um we've got to change barbie's body Mm -hmm. like we've got to change the narrative we've got to do something about this is interesting again if you kind of do the timeline in the opposite direction year from 1990 um to 2016 um that's that's the sort of window that we're trying to make sense of i suppose the 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 argument that barbie creates eating disorders is in that time frame give or take um and it's something that i kind of want to think about and look about now um the longer history there is a longer history here um so the idea of Barbie's body is, as we've established, is something that kind of early promotional culture looks at. I just want you to take a look at this one thing. It's really fucking bad. It's not a good, positive thing that God. I think anybody should be looking at. But if I just get you to look at an image, um, this is referenced a lot. So I don't think this is as big a deal at the time, um, but it becomes something that becomes a big deal when uh, this is reported. Um, so can you explain? Uh, okay. Um, there's a <laughs> okay. background, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, we have um, a collection of images which appear to be accessories from, is it just one Barbie set or is it a, yeah, so it's a multiple Slumber ones? Slumber Party Barbie. Slumber Party Barbie. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, among the accessories included are um, a set of scales. So Barbie can weigh herself. Uh, a book that says, don't eat. <laughs> and another book that says, how to lose weight. So the, the, what it's year the same was this? book. So this is 65. It's the same book. So it's how to lose oh, weight. And then you flip it. On the other side. And it says, don't eat. Uh, and then a, a scale permanently set to 110 pounds. Um, this. And again, I think this is something that Barbie's a little bit more interesting because I don't like this. Like, the, no. I don't think this is cool. And often when you're asked to be like, well, why don't you like it if you don't think it's making an influence? Um, mm. There's something quite interesting of like, yeah. it's, it's quite hard to unpick sometimes where I'm like, well, I'm not sure this is necessarily the thing given an eating disorder, but I don't think it's a nice well, message either. This is this this is the, so often the case with a lot of these, you know, moral panics and concerns about various influences and things. It's that the, the feeling comes before anything resembling research yeah right so so it starts from a feeling like, oh i don't like this it feels 
icky. It is icky. It feels yeah. wrong. It is. Yeah. It feels and and you know like with the video nasties or or, or like other kind of panics like you know what might this be doing? Imagine if a kid saw this. Imagine <laughs> if a little girl like played with this. What yeah. would she get out of? What would what would she start thinking about herself? Yeah. Yes. So it's it's all it's all taking place in our imagination yes. before we know anything about where what it really does. I, I was going to say does to the girls, but that's probably the wrong question, isn't it? We we would say more what do girls do with that? Yes. Um, it's the classic sort of cultural studies switcheroo. There, it's like not what do what does media do to people, but what do people do with the media? Yes. Um, and I guess that's the question I'd be interested to explore. Yes. So we can talk about how children play with Barbies, and mm. we we can talk about that a little bit later. This I don't know how this is. Re- I couldn't find whether this caused a massive drama. Okay. Um, obviously, if you rele- if Mattel released this today, this would be front page news yes. around the world. I couldn't find anything that resembled that. But like I say, as the nineties begin to talk about bodies. They keep returning to this, and and I've got evidence of that um, in a in a few minutes' time. When does when do the body image concerns start? Then that's a very good question, Rich. Um, so we're going to look at the longer history of body image in a second. Uh, I just wanted to pull out a few things that happen that sort of like where body image begin, becomes to be co- uh, begins to become a major talking point in the popular press about Barbie, and then we can look at the kind of what what body image is or where it's come Mm. from because it's such a specific claim that I'm sort of wanting to interrogate a little bit um, with you. Uh, In 1995, um, there's a study done um, and this study is in the International Journal Journal of Eating Disorders. It's possibly one of my favourite things that I've ever read, both for how specific it is and how absurd it is um, in terms of what it's trying to do. Um, (laughs) So they measure... Um, Barbie and Ken's proportions and then they just like turn that into a real person they're like what <laughs> happens if we take this little doll and like what would this real doll look like as a fully right. uh, grown uh, human right <laughs> and there's this assumption of like that this is how people people that this is how players yeah. operate in or like unrealistic ideals yeah. and they kind of theorised <laughs> I've only got this quote because I know what's coming up in a second. They begin to theorise that this is what one in 100,000, like the only one in 100,000 people would ever have these proportions, that they're, they're, they're almost impossible um, to gather. Right. Um, this becomes quite a famous bit of research or it becomes quite an influential bit of research in the popular press. So this study uh, of the Barbie blown up to a real size person um, is one. It becomes like one of the kind of key pieces in a in a broader and bigger narrative about um, Barbie and body image. Um, so it's one of the facts that is featured on a um, what's called a Get Real Barbie fact sheet, which is a campaign um, that the South Shore mm. Eating Disorders Collaborative, um, which is a charity uh, in America. They produce this fact sheet that I assume is distributed um, to the press uh, on campuses. It becomes um, quite an important document, probably one of the more important documents, I think, that ultimately by 2016, this document has probably shaped Mattel's um, what Mattel thinks it should be doing in terms of Barbie. So you've got that fact sheet in front of you. Um, there's a list of about like 10, 12, 15 things. But what stands out to you? What are some of the key details that you think are interesting? Yeah, well, the, the preamble is sort of talking about, um, yeah, the unrealistic beauty ideals set by pop culture, um, how this can lead lead young people to diet. And then those people who diet can develop eating disorders. Um, and so the bullet points seem to be designed to Number one, emphasize how popular Barbie is and with whom. Yeah. So two Barbie dolls sold every second in the world and the target market is young girls aged three to twelve. Yeah. So straight away it's hitting you with the here's the here's the group that we can, you know, you invoke the young young children and particularly young girls, and straight away it's I think anything that comes later, people are gonna be like, okay, well, this is this is important. Yeah. Gotta got pay attention to this. Yeah. Um some of the other ones that jump out at me are about the proportions and, you know, if she were an actual woman, 
She would be five foot nine tall, have a 39 inch bust, an 18 inch waist, 33 inch hips, and a size three shoe. Um, Barbie calls this a full figure and likes her weight at 110 pounds. Um, she would have a BMI of 16.24. I don't, I don't know if that's, I don't know what that means. No, I, Do you, are you are you familiar I, with I've, BMI I've, numbers? No, and, I'm not. There's there's a lot of um, similar. I mean, but it's, it's so body mass. Index? Oh no, no, it's body mass index, yeah, but, yeah. I, but I don't know what. I don't know if 16.4 is. I assume that's. Bad, I assume it's low. But it, I assume yeah. it's bad. I don't know what <laughs> yeah. a good one is. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Um, but anyway, fits the weight criteria for anorexia. She likely would not menstruate. Um, my, my first thought in response to that is she's a doll. I don't think she <laughs> menstruates. Um, I don't think there's any danger of that. Um, if Barbie was a real woman, <laughs> if Barbie was a real woman, she'd <laughs> she'd have to walk around on all fours <laughs> due to her proportions. I that one just makes me think. Really, even if even if she is absurdly proportioned, like why would walking on all fours be easier or? So like, I, I don't know where... That, does that make sense to you, having read some of this stuff? Does that... No, I, that's the one where... So obviously, <laughs> we've got this study from 95 about where they, they, they draw the proportions and they're like, one in 100,000 women would look like this. I'm like, what? I've never met this woman who's crawling around <laughs> on all fours. What the... Why, no. why have I not encountered this? One in 100,000 seems high <laughs> It to does me. for that specific <laughs> circumstance. Um, so I, I, don't know, I don't know where that one comes from. Can I ask you a question, Rich? Of course. Do you want to see what the Barbie would look like as a full-size woman? More than anything I've ever wanted in my life. <laughs> this is is she walking around on all fours, though? Because <laughs> otherwise I'm not that interested. I'm bringing her through. No, I'm not bringing her into the podcast room. I've got a video uh, which is lined up for you next where uh, a very sweet and sincere um, student has been inspired by this fact sheet and is, is acting on it and thought it would be a useful visual demonstration, um, which again made national TV. Barbie is actually part of the National Eating Disorder Awareness Week. She's part of the Get Real Barbie campaign. And so when I was in high school, I saw this piece of paper that, uh, or this Get Real Barbie campaign, and it basically had all these statistics about Barbie, just these kind of mind-blowing statistics. And so I saw that her bust would be 39 inches, her waist 18 inches, and her hips 33. And I was just like, what would happen? happen if she were real like if you could actually see her it would really create attention it would really grab people just walking down the halls in my high school they would actually turn around and look because I mean as you can see you can't miss her so um, that was kind of how the idea stemmed it was part of this larger eating disorder awareness week to really create discussion about eating disorders and body image issues how have other women reacted to this uh, most people are shocked I think the general reaction among women and men is just shock and then there's sort of um, I guess you, you think back to when you're a little kid, it sort of makes you think back to, well, what was my relationship with Barbie? Or more so what, what the deeper image or the deeper goal really is, is to think about, well, what are these images as a child, the, the role models that you have as a child? Um, it's really questioning that. That's what Barbie is here to do. And so I think a lot of people have seen Barbie just on the surface as, oh, this crazy image. But hopefully what I hope people can gain is that to really be a critical viewer of the media and really question um, the things that are given to you as a young person. And also just as you grow up, just questioning the media. Um, Describe the Barbie. <laughs> so we'll post a, a picture of the Barbie on our Instagram so you can you can have a look at the Barbie. I mean, it looks unlike any human certainly that i've ever seen but also unlike any doll that i've ever seen i am i right so i'll describe it in a moment but can i just first ask what might be a really dumb question yeah surely if you made the barbie doll life size it would still look exactly like a barbie doll just bigger why why are the proportions right so so i'll describe it the the, the it looks i i mean imagine slender man and then give it the most ridiculous shoulder pads you've ever seen and a boob job <laughs> is kind of kind of what I'm thinking. You know, in Alien Resurrection, where Ripley finds the room <laughs> of like the versions of herself, I'm just <laughs> imagining this Barbie like, kill, kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Please kill me. <laughs> Pray for Barbie. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that is... <laughs> The the ongoing narrative, I think you've got a flavour of, like, the speed um, with which Barbie goes from, like, something that's criticised for the role model she's providing to young girls in terms of 
the kind of gender roles that the the young girl would expect to be to Barbie is encouraging certain types of disordered eating amongst young girls or setting unrealistic images that a girl can never um, possibly live up to because she will also (laughs) look like whatever haunted, weird Barbie doll, um, you know, the full-size Barbie doll is going to look like. So that's... Broad. That's broadly the context. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested now in how we get from point A to point B as a generalised comment. So then the name of the episode is "Does Barbie give you eating disorders?" It's not "Does Barbie give you, um, you know, bad uh, role models?" Then or, the, or you're going to live up to it's, it's "Does Barbie give you eating disorders?" And mm. I think something really interesting happens in those intervening years, um, which partly explains this hyper focus on the body as opposed to perhaps other things that may or may not be going on um, with Barbie. So central to this is a phrase that I have been using my entire life um, that I've never really stopped to think about as much as I did whilst researching this episode. And that phrase is the idea of body image. Um, Talk me through, when I say body image, what does it conjure for you? What do we mean by the phrase body image? Uh, I would, I yeah, I mean, I've not given it much thought myself, um, but off the top of my head, it's, it's body self-image is what I think of. It's how someone feels about their body, usually not just, you know, it, seen in a vacuum, but in relation to other bodies that are out there in the world which may or may not be gendered. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's what comes to mind to me. No, that's that's absolutely yeah. it. So this kind of self-perception of one's own body and how it interacts with the rest of the world. That has come to shape the way we think about bodies in general, specifically the way that we talk about girls' and women's bodies. Um, and what's interesting here is that that seems obvious. So, of course, you've got a self-perception of the world. The idea or a self-perception of self that interacts with the world. Um, What I'm intrigued by is how that's come to dominate the entirety of thinking about particularly Mm. women's and girls' bodies. It's not just women and girls. There's bits of research that about men and boys and and masculinities. But obviously, looking at Barbie, we are kind of focusing in on um, this relationship between gender and body image. But more importantly, how body image comes to dominate how we're thinking about eating disordered, disordered eating, but also the wider sense of oneself in the world. That's quite a specific way of thinking about it. Mm. Um, um, and I hadn't really put two and two together of like, oh, there's loads of ways of thinking about your own body. Um, the body image that you have is quite a specific term, um, but it's come to, you know, it's so um, generally accepted as a term that we don't kind of question it and we don't really think about it. Um, there's an amazing book by Sylvia Blood, The Social Constriction, the Social Construction of Women's Body Image. Um, so the book's called Body Work. Um, a lot of this is cribbed from here. So if you want to read a little bit more about this, um, she does an amazing job of tracing this longer history of body image and how body image comes to dominate mm-hmm. the way that we talk about women's bodies, and particularly in relation to... Uh, ideology and like eating disorders and other things like this. Um, so like all fucking terrible things, whenever you dig into this, experimental psychology in the 1960s and <laughs> 70s was trying to understand anorexia parents, like gen- uh, anorexia patients, like generally every time uh, something, I'm like, oh, where's this come from? It's always from 1670s experimental psychology. I've often thought if I had, uh, the, if we did like the Stanford prison experiment <laughs> and I was one of the guards, uh, I would definitely just put you in a room with loads of experimental psychology because I know that that would be your <laughs> living hell. What's the, the meta experimental <laughs> yeah, yeah. psychology? Oh, do you know this uh, study that happened on some fucking American university campus in 1967 <laughs> explains everything? Oh, does it know? Was, was it a weird experiment? Yeah, we surveyed... A thousand drunk 19-year-olds <laughs> for college credit. Oh, my God. Well, if you like studies that in- involve postgraduate students, <laughs> have I got some history uh, for you. Um, so this idea of body image, it does come from experimental psychology. It, it develops from specific studies that start off in quite a specific, narrow way. And as with a lot of this stuff, 
begins to take over everything. But let's start with the kind of um, initial studies. They're trying to understand anorexic patients. They're trying to kind of make sense of how anorexic women may or may not see themselves um, compared to... Uh, I'm going to keep using this phrase. Uh, if I was there in person, I'd be putting quote marks. You know, imagine I'm doing the annoying kind of bunny ears thing. Um, this is all in the literature, but like normal women. So there's anorexic right. women, there's normal women. Um, and there's this really famous study that takes place in 71. Um, so the hypothesis is anorexic patients would significantly overestimate their, their size mm. compared to um, normal women. Right. So the logic is basically women who have disordered eating or are anorexic, they think they're fat and therefore are trying to lose weight in order to, you yeah. know, to they, they, they have a weird sense of themselves and the yeah. weird sense of themselves is causing the anorexia, which isn't like, it's not a terrible thing. I will get on to what I don't like about it in a second. But I, I, I want to hear your thoughts about why you don't like it. But I, I would say that's not a, that's, that's a reasonable description of how a lot of people talk about anorexia and anorexic people. Well, come on to that. Because I, th- I think, like like I say, I think that's, you know, these are people who are working with anorexic women. They're not yeah. completely coming to this completely cold. I, I think for some women, some of the time, that makes sense. Or that could be something that we could explore. So I think the starting proposition, I don't love it, but I don't think it's terrible. I think it's the sort of thing that experimental psychologists may, you know, that, that m- might be something that we would interrogate yeah. and investigate. Um, and in order to do this... Um, they get two groups of women. We've got our anorexic women. Um, I think I should probably mention at this point, like they, they, they are, you know, committed. They're um, they they are seeking help, so it's not right. you know they're not just taking them out. And um, so the the people, the anorexic women that they're working with, and then they have a control group. The control group is my favourite and yours, postgraduate girls, postgraduate women um, who are doing their degrees as Amazing. part of the university, um, and so on and so forth. This is where already, I don't want to narrativize it too much, but this is where it's introducing stuff that I don't particularly love. Um, they get both groups of uh, women. Uh, they put them in a room. <laughs> they get them to take the clothes off. They start measuring. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What year is this happening? So this is 71. 71. Ethical clearance? I mean, is ethical clearance, uh, is it a universal thing at, that, at this okay. point? Possibly anyway, not. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah, That's all right. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's you can already see, like, this is an uncomfortable situation. Yeah. Um, whether, and again, the details, we don't have as much about the details, but presumably these are men and the research team who are doing the measuring. So it... it, it it's a creepy situation. It's a it's a not particularly um, conducive way to get a real true sense of no. um, what's happening. So if, what happens if, is it, sorry. If you wanted to give me some like you know real complexes about my body, <laughs> you would get me to take my clothes off in a room full of strangers and researchers. Yeah, and, and get the measuring tape out. That I can't. Yeah, horrible. <laughs> Pass. Yes. So already you've spotted a flaw, I think, in in what's taking place here. Um, Then what they do is they create something that is called the Body Image Perception Index, um, BPI um, for short. So what they've got then is they've got the two groups of women. They've got the anorexic women. They've got the control group. Um, They measure the women. They kind of measure particular body parts, uh, various different things. And then they ask the women to... Imagine what their body size is. So to measure themselves without having access to the tape measures. So like, how big do you think you are in terms of this? Um, Then what they do is they create something called a body perception index, um, which is their perceived size times 100 divided by their real size. So real size in quote marks, um, what they've been measured as versus their perceived size. And if you're under... You've got a bad body image, broadly speaking. Okay. Um, that obviously raises loads of questions of like, it's really like what what? How do you measure yourself? Yeah, and also some women would probably know their measurements yes. because they might have got measured recently. They might have they know what size clothes they wear. Yeah. Like so, certainly like things like waist, for example. Yeah. Bust size, I imagine. Yeah, a lot of the women would have a reasonable 
accuracy on. But, I, but I'd be interested to know what the, if there was a difference between the two groups. So, initial study they do find they, that, 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 you know, the hypothesis is proven that, and the anorexic women have uh, a poorer understanding, supposed poorer understanding of their own size. Um, okay. So it, it's really influential because they get that initial hypothesis mm. is sort of demonstrated. It's small mm. sample sizes, but, you know, so the, the, the body Im- image perception index becomes really, really, really influential. At first, amongst... You know, people who are doing eating disorder research, people who are kind of working with anorexic women, this idea that um, what is causing the anorexia is that they have an incorrect sense of self and they're constantly overestimating what they actually are in reality. Um, This like this BPI, that kind of slightly weird formula, this slight quirk of like, the idea that you should be able to always accurately be able to measure oneself. And if you can't, something is going (laughs) wrong there, becomes really, really, really influential in the 1970s and into the 80s. I'm not going to list them. So the the, the BPI, it becomes a model for other similar-ish types of research, other kind of similar types of measurement. And that method adapting it, you know, creating your own index, um, adapting it to kind of create new different things. Uh, And then also kind of adding in like different types of quant research. So you ask, you know, people how happy they are with their body. And then you kind of do statistical analysis on the answers compared to whether, you know, they measured themselves in this or like Mm. all of this. It becomes a really influential body of research. And they continue to tweak it and they kind of continue to think about and this stuff. And like I say, there's a dozen of them. There's dozens of them, but we don't need to get into that. Like that core kind of seed of the research is important for what um, we are going to do next. Um, You might have noticed body image starts life as quite a specific clinical thing to understand a particular type of eating disorder. Mm. Um, It is not used like that anymore. It's a much more generalist um, Topic And what we find is that increasingly it moves away from this quite specific and hyper-focused research question to embrace all women and all girls. How how do you think that happened? I mean, I was literally just about to ask you that question. How did that happen? (laughs) Yeah, I was because I was in like when I was reading this book, I was like, like, that's such a it's such a shift and it happens so quickly. By the 1980s, what some researchers start to find is that you can't replicate this or it doesn't replicate in comfortable, easy ways. Um, What happens is sometimes you do this and actually the anorexic women have quite an accurate sense of their own body proportions. Mm. And when you compare that to the quote unquote real women or the normal women, um, the normal women don't. Their perceptions are incorrect. How would you interpret that data? Say it again. So what they find is that women, normal, regular women, they sometimes are terrible at estimating their own. So they, they, they reverse it. Sometimes the anorexic women are bad at it. Sometimes the, the normal women, they, they repeat their study and it just becomes messy. There's no clear pattern amongst either groups of girls and women. Well, then the, the logical conclusion then would be that eating disorders are not linked to body image. That would be, or that's certainly one interpretation. So it's, there's a yeah. there's a mini debate in the eighties. Uh, I was I was fascinated by there's a mini mini debate where so either you can kind of go, well, yeah, anorexia and body image perhaps aren't related at all. Then that this is this is noise or this kind of model that we've been working on isn't creating clean enough data for us to make any generalized claims. It's not accurate enough, or it's messy. Or as you say, perhaps actually this has nothing to do with anorexia. So there is somebody who makes the argument in the eighth, like um, they're, again, a clinical psychologist, but they they actually kind of make the argument that if you go and talk to women who are currently anorexic, um, often it won't be that they think they're fat. They kind of have a very strong sense of their own self and they understand fully what their body, Mm. um, what they are, what their body shape looks like and how much they weigh because they weigh themselves every single day, Mm. that this isn't related to that at all. It's not that they've got a weird body image. It's that 
and they enjoy the power, they enjoy the control, they enjoy yeah. the sense of ownership over their own life. Like there's there's multiple reasons why. Um, so if you start with the subjects and speak to them about their own experiences, you get slightly different answers. It's yeah. not necessarily that they're all like, oh, I think I'm fat, therefore I need to lose weight. And um, that isn't what's happening. So we do have, we do have in the literature, we have people making this argument, um, kind of going, no, this isn't what is taking place. So that's one interpretation. Is that the interpretation that carries forward in the uh, bulk of the literature? It is fucking not, Richard. Uh, did anyone listen to this guy? They read him because he's referenced quite a lot. But did anyone listen to this central argument? Uh, no, um, not so much. So the other way that you can interpret this finding is to say that perhaps all women have a body image disturbance. Oh, okay. Let's <laughs> see. Let's see. Um, and you frame that as a pathology that you have discovered, which is prevalent not just in anorexic women, but it's prevent, pre present in all women. And therefore, anorexic women in particular are the logical conclusion of what all women are experiencing at all time. There's also a weird thing going on here where it, though, where it assumes that, um, you know, satisfaction with the way you look is is linked to accurate measurements. Like, why why does <sighs> why does the accurate measurement have to do with being happy or not happy about it, your size or shape or? Yeah, they're I, specific feelings, aren't they? Yeah. And as you kind of indicated, I if you ask me to kind of measure, I don't know what that would mean. Yeah. My inability to understand my own body in a very, very, very specific measurement -y way is completely divorced. And I know this from my own life of like my happiness or unhappiness with my own body is not really about size necessarily all the mm. time. It's a sense of feeling. It's, you know, do these clothes fit or not yeah. fit? Yeah, 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 yeah. Am, am I feeling healthy this week or not healthy? Like, yeah. How it, does this compare to what clothes I used to fit into? And Absolutely. And they're all ongoing. Like. And I suppose this is as a useful a point as any to be like, what I'm not doing is saying that women don't live in a society where they are, you know, encouraged to feel terrible things about their body in different ways from a variety of inputs. And that it's really hard to make sense of that. So we're not saying that women don't have complicated relationships to our body, but this really hyper-specific claim that if you're unable in a lab to measure yourself accurately compared to with somebody with a tape measure, that therefore you are having a, pathologi a pathologized version of body disturbance that could eventually lead to an eating disorder, that seems quite a specific claim particularly when you have this like fork in the road in the 80s yeah. where some guys like should we just chuck this in the bin should we get rid of it and uh other people are like or I... we should start experimenting <laughs> even further yeah uh, and it, that's what it becomes it becomes a big moment in this particular type of research where they go we don't need the anorexics anymore we can do this all women and girls have a potential to be body disturbed or have a body image disturbance that we need to study therefore we can increasingly go out into the general population and start testing this hooray we can get non non anorexic <laughs> naked ladies into our into our study room instead great Janet, get the measuring tape <laughs> Gen genuinely i'm still thinking about that though that that's still the thing that i'd be like if i was part of that study i'd be like Oh, why am I having to do this? Like, it's that, worth that's, refocusing that's, on. That's, yeah. that's worse than the having to measure yourself, it's, and, and would have a bigger bearing on, yeah, like my ability to, you know, accurately guess anything. Probably my name. Yeah, if, if I'm standing there with my pants off in front of. Yeah, I mean, it it, it gets worse. We're not going to look at specific versions of this, but they end up doing like some genuinely quite traumatizing and horrific things to women in the oh, name God. of locating and identifying this particular pathology that is, you know, body image, including, <sighs> like, putting them in front of mirrors in brightly lit rooms and then getting them to reflect on. Like, there's some really, like... I I'm grateful that I have never had to experience this. I don't know how it got ethical clearance. Um, 
beyond the fact that the claim is, but we're trying to you know protect women and girls um, and, and and other things um, like that. As you would suspect, once they've got this, once they're going, okay, this is something that potentially all women might experience. We need to go and look and test this across all women. You then need, you know, a causal explanation. Um, as you can imagine, they start looking all over the shop. Um, they kind of identify. Uh, <laughs> it's quite sweet in the literature where they're like a socio-cultural influence, <laughs> and that's all they're looking. They look because they're like, it's probably socio-cultural, and you're like, yeah, no shit. And they're like, so we need to locate the socio-cultural thing, uh, including like TV episodes, advertisements, uh, and Blood does a really, really, really good job of taking some of this shit down. Of like. The idea that sitting in a room watching an advert in highly lab controlled yeah. conditions is sociocultural, but not the lab itself. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, don't talk to your neighbor about what you see. We want a pure experiment. And you're like, ah, oh, this is this is weird. This is kind of what's taking place um, and so on and so forth. This is the bigger context for the Barbie stuff. Okay. Um, so this is where, so if you imagine if we, what we were talking about before by sort of 95, they're measuring Barbie. You can see the, lo- the, the, the kind of internal logics of like, we're going to measure Barbie. Barbie's an influence. We need to understand how Barbie is influencing mm. body image on young girls and women. Um, I'm going to talk you through two journal articles um, that I've read. Um, I don't think these are particularly terrible in the context of other researches that happen at the time. Like, I've not picked them because I think they're particularly egregious or they're like evil or they're bad. They're working in a, a model that, you know, is established. And they are not the people who've established them. So I don't want it to be like, I'm giving these a kick in. Yeah. But I do want to explore these papers in particular because I think they're quite useful for understanding the way that these claims are sometimes made and the way that kind of Barbie becomes implicated uh, in it. So the first paper is called Does Barbie Make Girls Want to Be Thin? The Effect of Experimental Exposure to Images of Dolls on the Body Image of Five to Eight-Year-Old Girls. What year has this been published? This is published in 2006 in Development Psychology. Okay. So more recent, I, I was the same yeah. as you when I was looking at it. I was like, 95 is about in my head when this stuff would be kind of really taking place. But no, this is 2006. Okay. All I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk you through the main methods. I'm going to talk you through the interpretations of the findings. Um, and you can you know, cut in whenever you want to cut in. Um, have a think about what's going on here. So um, the first journal article, they create three different picture books. Um, so... Um, Picture book one is about a Barbie who is um, going shopping and getting ready to go out for a party. So they use pictures of the Barbie in various different situations. I think it's like eight pictures that they use. Um, They create a little picture book. They're going to read the picture book to a group of young girls uh, between the ages of five and eight. So 162 girls in total. We'll we'll, we'll get get onto that in a second. Group two, um, the same thing. But they swap Barbie for a doll called the M doll, which was a plus sized fashion doll or a real size fashion doll, as she was pitched at the time. And that is based on the proportions of a model at the time who I think was size 16. Okay, she's quite tall. So she's still 90s glamour model, if I'm honest. But, you know. Real, real size fashion doll. They do exactly the same setup. So it's a fashion doll in pictures, getting ready to go out for a party. And then they do uh, a control group, quote unquote control control group, uh, where they just use abstract images. There's no dolls of either things. Uh, they do this across a few schools in Sussex. Um, and they kind of split the groups, uh, different year groups, different groups of girls. So I don't think the the group size are, are any bigger than three. Um, so, you know when I said there's dozens of slightly weird models to measure body image? Here's another one. So this is called the Arbez. Uh, Arbez? Arbez. Does it stand for something? It does stand for something. Right. It's, it stands for the Revised Body Esteem Scale. Okay. Uh, so they take that. So this is already established. They've not created this themselves. They take the Revised Body Esteem Scale and they adapt it for young girls. It's going to be important, and I'm going to keep reminding you of this. The youngest of these girls is five. 
And, and they're being read too, did you say? They're being read too right. um, in small groups. What they do is they ask the groups of girls a series of yes, no, maybe questions, <laughs> including... <laughs> I nearly I nearly created a uh, revised body steam scale for you. I thought it'd be interesting to do. Uh, questions to five-year-old girls, including, I'm pretty happy about the way I look. Children my own age like my looks, and I really like what I weigh. Oh, okay. <laughs> so these are interspersed with generic questions. I like reading Harry Potter. So it's not as, like, it's not as direct as it sounds, but, I, yeah... It's not particularly cool. I don't love it. Let's just say I don't love this revised body esteem scale. And I certainly don't love it in the context of going into a classroom with five-year-old girls. Do we need a revised, revised body, uh, <laughs> the body r- estimation r- scale? R- yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, like the Spanish R. <laughs> uh, so normally it's a five-point scale. It's, it's a, you know, it's a three-point scale. Uh, and then they do another. So I said there's a, quite a few different models. Uh, they do a second thing called the actual ideal body size discrepancy, which is very, very, very similar to what we did before um, because they're younger girls or because, you know, different adaptations um, have taken place. This is less about being able to accurately measure to the kind of the centimeter what's going on. Um, but it's working on a similar logic of basically um, you ask them to draw in a uh, You know, they've got a a number of um, stick figures or like little kind of cartoony figures that you can kind of go, this is what I am at the moment. This is what I'd like to be. And then they also ask, this is what I'd like to be when I'm an adult. And again, you can subtract the real, you know, the real or the sense of what they think they are compared to um, what they might want to be. And all of that is about um, measurements. Like, uh, it's, it's yeah. So that you've got like a thin stick figure, a, a slightly right. Um, okay. Thing, oh, and it's, so they just have to point to the one that they want. Yeah. So they right. they colour in the one that they they are want to be and want to be when they're older. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yes. I don't like it then. No, I don't like it either. Um, you can probably guess what happens next. Um, so they read. The Barbie group, the Barbie one, the M group, the M one, and the control group, the control group one. They get them to complete it. And then you can track and measure what, to what extent has Barbie influenced or not influenced um, these particular discrepancies of body size and body esteem as well. I hate these studies. (laughs) I've, I've not even read what you're talking about and I hate them. I hate the... The kind of the lab based, you know, methodologies behind these kinds of things and the way that built into all this stuff is that stupid fucking assumption that that there are no other influences outside the room that they're currently in. Like that the, the only possible explanation, the only variable has to be the Barbie book. Yeah. There can't be any other explanation other than that that would determine that they would pick that stick figure over that stick figure. Yeah. I mean, they're working in a, in a, a scientific method that sort yeah. of makes sense in the abstract. Like, this is how we would test certain types of things. And, you know, this, this would make sense yeah. in certain contexts. I think when you're trying to locate the sociocultural influence, um, as Blood kind of suggests, there are bigger influences in the room up to and including a stranger's here to read you a book. Um, and I, I, I keep stressing the ages because, like, Five is so young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To sit and go to reflect on your own satisfaction with your own body, like the idea that you're going to be able to answer accurately in that situation. Yeah, like I, I'm, I'm not sure I'd be able to answer these questions on a yes, no, maybe. There's also the assumption, the, the the problem which is there in a lot of like not even just child studies, but but any kind of studies with with researchers where you wonder whether the research participants are kind of trying to second guess what the researcher wants them to say or do. Yeah. And particularly with the five-year-olds, like I can, you know, I've got young kids, like my kids are seven and four and, and like, you know, I can well imagine them recently or like around the ages they are now just, just kind of being like, I don't know this person. I don't know who they are. Like, have they been told like what 
what they're coming yeah, in to it's do all and set up reasonably. So it's not about the body image per se. They're right. going to like they're going to read you a story. They're going to ask you some right. questions. It's it's fairly you know the safeguarding's there. It's, yeah, it's reasonably ethical. Um, the findings. So let's kind of jump into the findings a little bit. So you you know maybe you'd be surprised. Maybe you wouldn't. They do find broadly. They interpret their own findings that it does in fact cause an increase in girls' body dissatisfaction. Um, so for them, they theorise that absolutely the the, the, the the Barbie girls have a worse sense mm-hmm. of themselves to the other girls. They don't find this is true across all the year groups, so they split them into five, six, and seven. So what they, they don't actually find that for the seven-year-olds, which again would, for me, suggest there's a noisiness to this mm-hmm. data. Um they don't interpret it as that. So one of the quirks of this research is they actually interpret that as suggesting that it's more critical, that actually by the ages of seven, you don't need to take this in from the Barbie book. Um, you are, in fact, already, you've already got the, you know, you've got the pathology, you've got the right. body image disorder. Okay. Um, so five is when you're internalizing it because it, that's in a more important age for development than, than seven. So the fact that they don't get this response in the seven-year-olds, it doesn't necessarily prove or disprove in their interpretation of it. It's actually quite important that we get the five-year-olds first, that we don't let five-year-olds um, look at pictures of Barbie because it's, it's really a critical moment of development. Um... I'm guessing these studies were just kind of, you know, uh, short term kind of things, because because I think that the other thing with that is like, well, how do we know if, you know, consuming a particular image or set of images or playing with a particular toy, even if we did find through some kind of study and it was well designed that it had some kind of effect or influence on body image or, or, or feelings about oneself? How do we know that those feelings persist over time? Yes. So they have this like this amazing line where they're like, "This happened in ten minutes. Imagine what daily Barbie play could do." <laughs> and you're like, "Oh fuck yeah!" Ima- I mean, imagine these. You've taken girls who've managed to avoid this stuff so far, and you've yeah. created a group where just imagine the psycho like the psychological damage yeah. that can be taken. If that's ten minutes, like within t- you know, if they did it for two hours, are they walking on all fours by that point? Like, you know, <laughs> is that how long it takes? Okay, so the second paper I'm really interested in, um, in part because it agrees and takes as a default position the first paper. So it's building on the findings that they've got. Um, And they want to explore it in a couple of slightly different ways. Um, Again, very similar setup, similar uh, number of girls. So it's 117 girls. Um, this time they're going to actually let them play with Barbies. I mean, one of the okay. quirks of the first study is that no one actually ever plays with a doll. It's a picture of a doll, which is like already quite an unusual relationship mm-hmm. to a toy. Yeah. They've created a, they've added a layer of mediation that you didn't necessarily need to add. Um, so in the second study, they actually take the layer of mediation away. They're going to let the uh, children play with stuff. Um, their control group is Lego. So you've got one group of girls who are playing with Lego. You've got one group of uh, girls that are playing with Barbie. And you've got uh, one group playing with the M-Doll. I have a working theory that only body image researchers bought the M-Doll. <laughs> there's just little, like, there's hundreds of scientists around the world buying it. And that's it. They're the only people buying this fucking M-Doll um, that, you know, was a, was a big deal, apparently, in the 90s and 2000s. So they do they do really similar tests. So like the body esteem test, I think they tweak it again. But it, the, the the broad thing that they're looking at is they want to generate numbers that they can do statistical analysis on. And the body esteem test, the actual uh, ideal body size discrepancy test. They also do a third test, um, which is worse, I think. So at the end of the uh, play session, they put out different bowls of sweets chocolate-covered peanuts, mm. uh, and they're kind of different coloured, but they say, you're allowed, you're doing a taste test at the end of it. You're allowed to eat as much as you want. Um, you guys go ahead, do a taste test, and, and we'll, um, you know, that's that's part of the study as well. They're not doing a taste test. We're measuring their food intake. <laughs> and did playing with Barbie make them eat more sweets or less or fewer sweets? Well, actually... 
in this study, they don't replicate the first study at all. So a, 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 an interesting thing that happens is they do the same study, and what they find is that the girls, the Barbie doesn't have any negative impact on body esteem or actual body size discrepancy compared with the M-Doll or the control group who are playing with Lego. They don't find any significant correlation between the Barbie and the M, or they do actually. They find that the Barbie group eats less and in the paper they're like, ha ha ha, we've, we've cracked it. Apart from for that fucking annoying Lego control group, Lego and Barbie are exactly the same. Mm. So they've got the chart that I've lifted from the paper. Can you describe it and then answer how you think they interpret it? Okay, so we've got a very basic bar chart uh, with three columns. Uh, we have thin dolls, average sized doll, and no dolls along the bottom. And along the side, the vertical axis, is food intake in grams. So it's saying how... How much, how many sweets, basically, um, each group ate after playing with the dolls. Yeah. Um, and we have the thin dolls and the no dolls look bang on the same or almost identical. So the group that didn't play with any dolls, is that the Lego ones? Yeah. Okay. So the Lego group and the ones who played with Barbie. Yeah. Ate the same. Mm-hmm. So just over 30 grams of food. Those that played with the M doll, the average size doll, ate about 45 grams. So quite a lot more. Yeah. How do you think they interpret this finding? Uh, well, Oof. I don't know. I'm trying to think how I, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to put my mind now. <laughs> I'm trying to put myself into the perspective of a developmental psychologist. Well, whilst you think about this, I'm going to... So they have... They don't find any, in terms of the esteem stuff that they're looking for, they don't replicate the first study. Rather than saying, look, I'm not sure this is what we found, they suggest that actually letting the girls play with the dolls may be... That might be part of the answer. So perhaps it is still true that Barbie is causing negative body esteem, but perhaps the fact that it was mediated via something that looks like a magazine is actually reflecting the fact that the media is more important for norm setting than playing with Barbie. So they don't disregard the fact that, you know, they don't kind of say, oh, this study, mm. we've not found, we've not found what we were looking for. And they kind of just, it, it just reinforces what they already believe, which is that the Barbie must do something, but perhaps pictures of Barbie are worse than toys. I mean, the other way to interpret this would be um, not playing with Barbie makes you have an eating disorder, but playing with the M doll makes you fat. You did it. <laughs> or they don't even say fat. They say M doll is good for girls because they eat more. So it's oh, so there's no. They media, use the no phrase. It. It's a relief effect because the M doll has released and relieved these girls of their normal social anxieties and normal social pressures. So they are allowing themselves to eat more which is broadly a good thing because within the context of the work that we're looking at, um, body esteem is a pathology. Yeah. A pathology creates anorexia. Therefore, the logic of eating more is broadly a good thing because we want our uh, young girls to be eating more, to grow up, to be you know, bigger women or whatever it is that's taking place. I am not making any sort of judgment on whether you should or shouldn't be eating more. But that is a wild interpretation. <laughs> but why would the Lego group not be different then? Yes. Because because Lego Lego figures aren't like you know perpetuating any stereotypes about body image. Yeah, what I they're clearly not real. What like, I love about this people. research is that quite quickly on into into the findings they sort of just drop the fact the control group exists <laughs> completely right. and they're just comparing M and Barbie. You're like it's sort of the thorn in their side because it <sighs> obviously they were looking. They, so really, they wanted to find out that actually, Barbie group eats less than the M group. Yeah, and from there you can theorise that the Barbie group is creating body esteem disorders, and the body esteem disorder creates you know girls won't eat. You know yeah. that's that's the through line that they're getting. The Lego group fucks it all up because Lego and Barbie are exactly the same. 
So you can't make that claim. So you then have to kind of reinterpret through the lens of what you're looking at. And they go, well, the M group is good. It's positive. It's a good thing. The girls are eating more. Right. Um, so that is the tale of the two studies. You can see in this how this research replicates itself and yeah. reproduces itself and certain logics and assumptions about what girls and women are doing when they look at themselves in the mirror. You can see how this takes place. You've covered this. You've got there before I did. What are these studies missing? Like, what, what, are, we, what are we absent of in the studies that take place here? Well, it's the, it's the qualitative stuff. It, 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 like, straight away, when you said in the first study... As soon as you said the words, they gave them yes, no, maybe questions. I was like, oh, for God's sake, they've already messed it up because they're already simplifying <laughs> what is a really complex process. Yeah. Wherein you're trying to get people to talk about how they feel about themselves in relation to other people and other body shapes that are available and, and how they play with dolls or don't play with dolls. There's also the the aspect which we haven't mentioned, which, like, there's no sense of whether any of these... Was it all girls, the study? Yes, all right? girls, yeah. So d- did any of them play with Barbie already or not play with Barbie already? Was that a variable that they tested for? Because I would have said that would be quite important. It, it is actually... So to be fair, that is something that the second study does. That okay, is a good. variable that they're looking at. So they're asking particular types of questions. Right. And that does partly sometimes feed into um, some of the statistical analysis. It doesn't feed into the, the food intake analysis. Um, There is one thing that you said there that I'm always really fascinated by in experimental psychology, particularly around toys, is how little the children are allowed to play as children with the toys as they would in their actual daily lives. Um, The second study lets them play with the toys. (laughs) But there's this line where they're like, they had to play with it in a specific way in (laughs) order to make sure it was scientific across the three groups. So it was highly directed, controlled play. Which for me, the Barbie stuff is especially interesting because whenever you actually speak to real women about Mm. their experiences of playing with Barbie when they were children, you get all manner of like wild anecdotes and stories and like ongoing running soap operas. And that's actually, there's a book called Barbie's Queer Accessories uh, where Erica Rand does this. She speaks to adults. Um, She's speaking to, you know, older butch lesbians. She's speaking to quite a broad range of women about like, do you remember your first Barbie? How did you play with the first Barbie? And this is actually picked up a little bit in the Barbie film of like, we gave them a haircut. There's yeah. one like amazing anecdote where this woman's like, I threw her in the fucking fire. <laughs> you're like, cool, okay. Uh, I don't know what that says about you, but like, there's all these different ways of playing with Barbies mm. that sometimes are aggressive, sometimes are not aggressive, um, sometimes are kind of much more interesting than this allows for. What is not taking place in that sort of play is the kind of super um, kind of sense of like how body image is playing out in there i'd like to ask a question because because we've kind of jumped from the sort of 1970s those earlier studies that you mentioned yeah through to you mentioned the 1990s when that was when the sort of measuring barbie like real world barbie what would it look like in real life that's those kind of things yeah and then the studies that you've just presented are 2000s yeah? yeah 2006 2011 but yeah so so my first so you asked me at the start of the show uh, about my encounters with Barbie, and I didn't really have any in terms of the toy. Um, but one film I have seen, which you haven't mentioned yet, is uh, a film which came out in the 1980s called Superstar, the Karen Carpenter story. Um, have I just preempted what You've you're about just to say? Pre- oh. Literally, my next paragraph is <laughs> Amazing. about how adults play with Barbies. Okay. Please, tell me, yeah, tell me about this film. So it's, I've not seen it for quite a long time, um, probably 15 years or so. But um, that, yeah, Superstar, the Karen Carpenter story is kind of an experimental film by the queer film director Todd Haynes. Uh, 1985, I want to say? Seven. 1987, okay. But um, 1987, and it is sort of a, sort of a kind of experimental biopic about Karen Carpenter's eating disorders, but crucially, entirely told through Barbie toys. Yeah. And um, which progressively as the film goes on one of the main things i remember is is it you know he starts like hacking bits off the toy and it it kind of it looks really like twisted and weird and um yeah and to to sort sort of in order to depict um karen carpenter's sort of struggles with eating disorders um uses the barbie toy to do that um 
So that's mid eighties. So that's that's the first kind of explicit linking linking Barbie to eating disorders thing I have in my head. Yeah. So that's about the same time that so the first Daily Mail article that we started with is nineteen ninety. So there's, right. there's, there's this linkage. I think the history of body image as an idea and as a concept from the seventies to the nineties is entirely. It shares a history with the Barbie dolls kind of movement through different feminist ideals. Um, But indeed, that kind of attempts by adults as well to use Barbie to subvert meaning. Um, So there was a a film that I came across, Tina Lohotsky's 1977 Barbie, which again, like super experimental, um, using kind of stock. Um, stop motion animation or bits of like different um, kind of film footage using Barbies as the kind of image. So this is actually picked up in Erica Rand's Mm. work of like Barbie is an image that you can kind of play with in multiple ways. So children play with it in a kind of whole variety of ways that is sort of left out of the psychology studies. Yeah. um, Either deliberately or kind of specifically by targeting it. Um, That. There is a genuine, this is something that I wasn't able to find. It's actually really hard to find studies of young girls playing with Barbies in bedrooms or classrooms or playgrounds. Um, In part because it's harder to do. It involves kind of more their ethical thinking. In part because people just don't really care about girls' kind of cultural lives. Mm. Or perhaps not in the same way that the kind of body image stuff. um, That you would expect to find kind of a whole range of different plays. And a whole... um, mess of ideologies i suppose of like i don't want to just say that all girls are playing with them in this kind of highly kind of um alternative ways or ways that are pushing up against stuff and obviously not all adults are subverting barbies in the ways that um certainly todd haynes does in that film um and i did kind of there are quite a lot of examples of this uh i did search for barbie porn on my work laptop being like (laughs) It'll be interesting to see what Instagram <laughs> accounts there are. Don't do that because I learned the hard way uh, that isn't what you'll find. But I was looking for like Instagram accounts of people doing similar things to Todd Haynes, and there's loads of them. Um, I think it was quite a big deal like a few years ago, like the Barbie Savior, um, like Barbie goes to Africa, and it's right, sort of yeah, parody. Yeah. And that's that's in the film as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's the, there are kind of loads of examples of the way that people kind of use Barbie because she is such a rich text. You can subvert it in interesting ways. Well, I think in order to subvert something, the idea itself has to already be really strong, doesn't it? Yeah. Because otherwise, it's it's like with parody, right? That parody only makes sense if people already have a really strong idea of the way that thing normally works. Yes. The conventions, and then you exaggerate those conventions or you 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 subvert them. And that's where the the humour comes from or the playfulness. And I think there's something really, really interesting about Barbie because so much pressure is placed on this and I have given the tone obviously of not really I don't really like the body um, image research I find it kind of frustrating it's looking in the wrong places for stuff that mostly I, I think I probably agree with if you think about you know the social cultural influence influences on particularly women and girls but you know you know men and boys as well about what desirable bodies are what desirable bodies aren't about, you know, diet culture and not diet culture, about pressures to kind of um, look a certain way or not look a certain way or act a certain way. Like, obviously, these are all pressures that exist. Mm. So I think for somebody who researches culture, I don't want to deny that, you know, these things don't exist. That would be kind of a strange way of getting, uh, of making that argument. But the way that some of the psychological researchers try and get at this in this kind of hyper-focused way that Barbie causes an impact and an influence that is measurable in the moment that then has an obvious knock-on effect into adulthood. I'm just not sure they've demonstrated that. I don't think that's what necessarily is taking place here. Yeah, and there's also, I mean, the thing that that really bothers me with this, it's a bit of a pet peeve of mine, but the, the, the word unrealistic when it comes to like media images and, and things like that, it, it comes up a lot, and it was on the um, Get Real Barbie fact sheet that you gave me before. Um, but why is there an expectation on a toy that it should be realistic? Yeah. And why is it that we hold Barbie to those standards when we don't necessarily do that with, I, I don't remember, like, is G.I. Joe or Action Man like ever been like the focus of a thing around like realistic male bodies? If not, why? Um, I'm not saying it should be, but like, you know, people don't talk about Transformers as being unrealistic robots 
there's only certain kinds of images and certain kinds of toys that for some reason we hold to that standard of realism. I think there's a real disrespect for girls' culture mm. broadly in society, but in a lot of the academic literature. Um, it's something that we will speak about a lot on this podcast, I think, but like the idea of like the vulnerable figure yes, yes. of the child. Definitely. I think what we see in a lot of this research, because again, I don't think the people who did this research are bad people. No. I don't think their I think their heart is in the right place. I think they are working in a set of methods that make sense in certain particular contexts. Uh, and they're trying to investigate something that broadly is probably true you know young girls are given messages or young girls have complicated relationships to their bodies they're trying to investigate that um but i think what we see in a lot of the influence research is there's an anxiety and the anxiety is projected from adults onto children yeah whereas i think children as you've kind of spoken about have their own life worlds and inner kind of fantasies and forms of play that these projections struggle to capture and often actually aren't interested in capturing at all. They're interested in capturing something that is separate to what may or may not be taking place in there, which again isn't to say that all girls are necessarily playing in these kind of ways. And there's a lovely quote that I want to end with um, by Catherine Driscoll, who suggests in her book, Girls, girls play Barbie with both intense respect and passionate disregard for her hegemonic positions. Mm. And they can be in the same girl at the same time in the same play session. So it's not necessarily that they're completely disregarding Barbie. It's that we need to focus on the kind of contradictions and the naughtiness and the messiness of how girls are actually interpreting and playing with these Barbies rather than trying to kind of tap into a secret bit of their brain that we can then study and kind of analyse. Right. So this brings us to our starting question. Does Barbie give girls eating disorders? What have we learned, Rich? It sounds to me, Ben, like it's kind of complicated. <laughs> and we it's need to, always complicated. And we need to do more studies. We, do, we need to do more studies. Fewer numbers, fewer shitty bar charts and, uh, you know, symbols that don't mean anything. I'm quite hungry. I quite want to do some research with these chocolate-coated peanuts. Can, can we walk on all fours to get some sweets? Please. <laughs> You've been listening to the Ill Effects Podcast. Uh, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ill Effects Pod. I've been Ben. And I've been Ken. I mean, Richard. <laughs> Sorry. Nice one. <laughs> See you next time.